So something quite shocking has happened in the aftermath of the Southport massacre. Rather than tackle the very real issue of why our young girls are no longer safe to go to a Taylor Swift dance class without being stabbed to death, the mainstream media and political establishment have decided the real issue is the so-called far right and internet disinformation. So rather than look at the root causes of the growing hell that is dividing Britain, and I'm very clear about what they are, by the way, a failure of mass immigration, a failure of multiculturalism, and a lack of cultural assimilation. But rather than look at those difficult issues, the MSM has turned its attention to much easier issues. Nigel Farage, Tommy Robinson, and free speech. So at his press conference in the last hour, Slippery Starmer made two key points. First, do not discuss what happened in Southport or why it happened. And so I call on everyone to give them, and indeed the wider community at Southport, the space to grieve. And time for the authorities in Merseyside to do their job. There will be a time for questions, and we will make sure that the victims and families in Southport are at the heart of that process. That's the very least that we owe these families. But we also owe them justice. So while there's a prosecution that must not be prejudiced, for them to receive the justice that they deserve, the time for answering those questions is not now. But this happens every time there is a shocking crime or terrorist attack. And then the consequence to that is that the media cycle just moves on. The British judicial system throttles the free sharing of information. And I think this is purposeful because it means nothing changes. Most chilling to me today from Slippery Starmer was the clear call to social media companies like Elon Musk's X, seemingly threatening their ability to exist. To large social media companies and those who run them. Violent disorder clearly whipped up online. That is also a crime. It's happening on your premises and the law must be upheld everywhere. That is the single most important duty of government Service rests on security, and we will take all necessary action to keep our streets safe. Now, the journalists who asked questions of Slippery Starmer at that press conference seem to mention Nigel Farage more than anything about why Southport happened. I guess because he's the biggest threat to Starmer as Prime Minister come the 2029 election, the Reform UK leader has become the obvious person to blame simply for asking questions. The Guardian described him as a conspiracy theorist. And uh, Brendan Cox, he reckoned he was Tommy Robinson in a suit. Now, why did he get all of this criticism? Well, it was simply for this video. I know the Prime Minister went to lay flowers and was heckled, and it shows you how unhappy the public are with the state of law and order in our country. I have to say there are one or two questions. Uh, was this guy being monitored by the security services? Some reports say he was, others less sure. The police say it's a non-terror incident. Just as they said the stabbing of an Army Lieutenant Colonel in uniform on the streets of Kent the other day was a non-terror incident incident. I just wonder whether the truth is being withheld from us. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it is a fair and legitimate question. What I do know is something is going horribly wrong in our once beautiful country. What is wrong with that? Seriously, the truth is being withheld from us at the moment. Let's be honest about it. But Jess Phillips, the Labour minister who seems to have a visceral hatred for patriots like Nigel Farage, she responded very immaturely. And remember, this is the same Jess Phillips who was heckled by male Muslim agitators on the night of the general election. But this is what she had to say about Farage. The man isn't stupid, he knew what he was doing. Nigel Farage is going to grift. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, if you, anyone was expecting any different... Yeah. I mean, Nobody was expecting any different. You weren't expecting any different. I wasn't expecting any different. 
Um, like, and there is a broader issue of the disenchantment. Nigel Farage is just, you know, it's, it's a jester. Um, there is a broader disenchantment yes. that is far, far, far more important and um, where people are finding their information and how that information is regulated is far more interesting to me. Mm. And the complexities that have led to that dis disenfranchisement and how it manifests, whether it's through racism or, um, or violence or whatever it is, and how we can do something about that. Oh my goodness. Shouldn't the violence that Jess Phillips be concerned about be the violence of 11 young girls being stabbed at a Taylor Swift dance class. Instead, based on what she just had to say and what on Slip, based on what Slippery Starmer had to say during his press conference, it seems to me that Labour's answer to what's going on is a crackdown on dissidents, a smashing effectively of the ability to talk about what really happened. Now, my position on this, as regular viewers know, is very clear. I deplore any violence. But the two-tier policing, which I'm going to outline to you later in the show, has been out of hand. Reform UK has thankfully doubled down. Unlike the Tories, they are representing us in this parliament. Its chairman, Zia Youssef, wrote, the demanding silence of elected officials who dare to question the official narrative shows how authoritarian the left is. Questioning the government and standing up for the silenced is Nigel Farage's job. All the smears in the world will never stop him doing it. And its MP. For Great Yarmouth, Rupert Lowe added on X, there is no ambiguity that the IOC do... N oh, sorry, that's, that's the wrong tweet there. But he said there is a groveling failure uh, for certain groups. Now... Look, let's be honest. Slippery Starmer only called this press conference and meetings with the forces today after the protests post Southport. Why? Because he was heckled there. There was none of the soul searching after the gypsy riot in Hare Hills lead or after the Bangladeshis storming a police station in Whitechapel, London. It's far too easy to blame all these ills on the so-called far right and so-called disinformation. But I promise you that if you go down that path, this will happen again and again and again. We know that real extremism has actually been imported into this country. These sorts of attacks are not about an issue with knife crime. It's an issue with ideology. But by the way, for all of those folk who were promising some sort of utopia under a Labour government, can I just tell you what we've seen in the three weeks of Slippery Starmer and Angela Ranger? We have seen Roma Gypsy riots in Leeds. We have seen Bangladeshi riots in Whitechapel. We have seen a British soldier stabbed in Kent. We have seen firearms officers attacked by Muslim men at Manchester Airport. We have seen children stabbed in Southport. And we have now seen riots of all kinds from South End to Southport. The academic and pollster Matt Goodwin said this week that, quote, the inescapable conclusion is that we've simply let too many people into our country who hate who we are. He says there is a creeping sense of lawlessness and overwhelming sense of hopelessness. And he added, amidst a new ruling class that can no longer tolerate any criticism of the elite consensus, they either pass us by or are reframed so that the real story is never actually about the real story, it's about misinformation, disinformation, populism, racism, or anything other than the actual cause. And Matt Goodwin predicted in the days ahead after Southport, we will watch this playbook unfold again. Well, literally, we have watched it unfold today. Starmer's press conference proved him right. Thankfully, some of the left do actually understand the predicament the UK is facing. Paul Embry. 
for example, who, who wrote on X, Britain doesn't have a far right problem. Britain has a problem with a dominant liberal class that for years ignored legitimate mainstream concerns over economic injustice, crime and immigration and is now experiencing the blowback. Starmer's diversionary tactics will not solve the fundamental hell we have unleashed on our once great country. But to react now, let me bring in Peter Whistle for today's uncancelled interview. And it is wonderful to have Peter here for the first time here on Outspoken on a massive news day. He is, of course, the founder and director of the New Culture Forum, which I really recommend you follow on YouTube. He is also the leader of the Brexit Alliance. He served on the London Assembly for five years up until 2021. And he is one of those voices in Britain unafraid to tackle these difficult issues. And Peter Whistle, goodness me, quite a chilling press conference in a lot of ways from yeah. Keir Starmer. Because I don't know what your analysis is, but my takeaway is that we're being told, don't talk about what happened in Southport. Simply do not speculate. Do not look into the reasoning why. Just grieve. Yes. And if you dare do speculate, you will be punished by the social media giants because the government is going to crack down on them. Yes, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on, uh, Dan. It's great to be with you. Um, as you said, I think a bit earlier, uh, this is exactly as we would expect it to be. You know, the way that in fact people now are being handled. And um, I think my main concern really is, is that with all of the instances that we've seen and actually going back for quite a long way now, there is a feeling of people being managed and handled. And it has led to a situation where the level of kind of general anger that there is and frustration amongst, I would say, the majority of people has reached a pitch. Now, um, there's no question in my mind that one of the most important things there uh, to cause that has actually been what is obviously two-tier policing. Um, that is that uh, you go hard on some people and you basically kid gloves on other people. Um, you mentioned there the London Assembly, which I was on for five years. The point of the London Assembly, I would add, is that we get to scrutinise people like Sadiq Khan, the mayor, and indeed the chief of police, the police commissioner, um, which in my time was uh, Cressida Digg. Um, and I brought this up many times because it became quite clear to me as far back as 2020, uh, when we saw policemen, you know, taking the knee um, at a BLM rally and then followed by quite harsh um, treatment of counter demonstrations who came down to essentially protect statues in London. Um, it became quite clear to me that the whole approach was sort of quite different. It was the same as well with Extinction Rebellion. I know, I know we're not talking about that particularly today, but essentially, uh, same thing. Um, they somehow or other were allowed to get very near to the cenotaph, you know, uh, Dan. Um, and also we saw police laughing and joking around with Extinction Rebellion. There are some causes and some sections uh, of society who are treated more carefully. Now, uh, obviously, we saw that hugely during the Gaza demonstrations. Indeed. Now, given you've raised this, Peter, I've actually put together some footage of the past 24 hours. So what I want to do is play some examples and we'll discuss as we go. So here is some evidence of... Probably the most shocking piece of police aggression last night, which took place on the streets of West, Westminster, not far from Downing Street, where seemingly a completely innocent white man was subjected to real brutality without much pushback at all. So have a look at this. <laughs> Oh, 
we're back, we're back, we're back. And there was another example of some police aggression too in Westminster. Watch this. Now, Peter, we have not seen that, as you rightly point out, for the eco-extremists. I call them eco-terrorists, to be honest, and the fact that they're now being sent to prison, I think, proves my definition right. We did not see that, as you point out, with the Black Lives Matter protests, where the police literally took the knee. We did not see that with the Palestinian protests. And by the way, we certainly didn't see it after the riots. I know it's a different police force, but we didn't see it after the riots in Hare Hills, where we literally saw officers run away. So why is it Peter, that you think the police feel far more comfortable when they're dealing with, and I hate the term, by the way, because I think far right is just a catch-all term now that can be used for you. It can be used for me. It can be used for Nigel Farage. What does far right actually even mean? But it certainly feels like two-tier policing, does it not? Yes, it does. I mean, I, I, the first point I'd make, actually, you know, about the far right is that, and this is crucial, I think people realize this, or if they don't, they've got to, is that every criticism, every challenge to the official narrative will be called far right. It's not just these demonstrations. Anything now, the whole way in which these things are described has been shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. They've done, done it very successfully by basically taking over the language. And so essentially, if you are in any way concerned or worried, whether it's migration, whether it is uh, Islamic fundamentalism, whatever it might be, uh, you will be far right. Okay, so we have to sort of accept that that's what we're working with. Um, obviously, looking at these pictures, which I think are appalling, um, there is a sense in which uh, I feel that the police somehow are more frightened of, our, of certain groups than others. And uh, they feel that they sort of have almost carte blanche in a way to deal with those men last night in Downing Street, as you just sh saw. They, they have sort of carte blanche almost uh, to do that more. When we saw... But because during... they're white, though, because they're white, because let's just be because, clear yeah, about yeah. it. In Manchester, yeah. recently, when we saw that apparent example of police brutality, which, which was actually probably quite justified in context once we saw the footage of what had happened before and the police being attacked. But the difference was, presumably because these were non-white, quote-unquote, victims of police brutality, there was some sort of desire to create a George Floyd-style movement in the UK. That guy last night is a white man, so no one cares about the police brutality? Well, they do. Uh, but the problem is, is that our establishment doesn't. Um, and the fact is, is that the establishment, as you have pointed out, I'm sure many times, uh, has a narrative which cannot be challenged. You know, so therefore, one thing actually, Dan, that strikes me about all of this, actually, is, is that if you call it the left or the liberal left or whatever you want to call it, people who get, basically run the show in our institutions, they do not give an inch in any of the arguments. They do not... Uh, except there might be problems in any of the kind of issues that we talk about. They never do. They never give any room at all. And this has led to this kind of sense of extraordinary frustration. And now look, you know, I'm quite clear that there is absolutely, you know, uh, it is wrong to attack people with bricks and all of that. It's, we, all, we all kind yes. of know that. Yes, the left, but the left are very, very interested. The, the, the left are very interested in context on the whole, aren't they? We hear a lot about context now. So you have to look at the context in which this is actually all being done. And it's been done basically because it's been growing and growing for years now, where incidents happen, as you mentioned, like the soldier down in Gillingham being horrifically attacked. Suddenly it sort of disappears from the news agenda. Yep. And all of the issues are then put onto the people who are demonstrating. I don't know whether they are EDL or whether they're not. 
I mean, I suspect, you know, I thought the EDL is actually no longer even in existence, mm. Dan. I, I don't know. Well, yes. but in and of course, people... there's, we've now got the mainstream media lobbying for these organisations uh, to be banned at, at, at the press conference today. First, you know, I've only promised to talk to you about products on this show that are actually life changing. This one is a little bit more personal, lots of fun, and the fellas watching are going to completely get it. And I always say, if you're a girlfriend or a wife watching, this is the best present for your husband or boyfriend because I can assure you, men want our grooming routine to be easy, right? One and done. But the days of using the same trimmer for your face and your bits below are now over thanks to the brilliant people at Manscaped. They've come up with the ultimate package to keep your hairs trimmed from 12 to 6. Introducing the Beard and Balls Bundle featuring the Lawnmower 5.0 and the Beard Hedger. And no, it's not that type of lawnmower, folks. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it's a way to get precision trimming for all areas, even the sensitive ones, and get him as manicured as freshly cut grass. So this trimmer gets it right the first time. It's gentle on the skin in all the delicate places with two interchangeable skin-safe blades heads. You can choose between a precise trim or a smooth finish, and it's waterproof, so you can use it in the shower, which is so helpful. Next, the Beard Hedger, and whether you're going for a neat stubble look or a full-on lumberjack sort of beard, the trimmer has you covered because it features titanium-coated stainless steel T-blade and 20 length options, which you can use with a twist of the very handy zoom wheel. And just like the lawnmower, the Beard Hedger is also waterproof, which means that you can use it in the sink or shower. There won't be any water damage. It's got 60 minutes of runtime, an LED charge indicator, genuinely such a gentle product so there's no more cuts you'll keep your loved one happy and this product will increase your confidence too so it's a really good deal today uh 20 off you just need to use the code outspoken at manscaped.com www.manscaped.com use the code outspoken 20 percent off and free shipping no more juggling multiple tools or dealing with subpar results just efficient effective grooming wherever you need it for the premium grooming experience trust manscaped there were other examples peter though on the streets last night one particularly shocking moment where a 73 year old woman with a pacemaker who said that she was on the streets simply because she was devastated by the killing of the three young girls in Southport, but found herself being arrested. It's extraordinary footage. Watch what happened. Run into me. Yeah. You're just all right. I've got a pacemaker. Down I've, got a pacemaker. I've got a pacemaker. I've got a pacemaker. And they've just arrested me for walking up here. No, to reach the section 35. Oh, because they're there. You want to do them any tighter? That's why I'm trying to lock them so they can suck it in Well, actually, you're really tight in them. Well, I'm not. Really you really are tight in them and you're really making me. You're what? So can you relax? You're joking. Five seconds. Are you joking? Okay. I've never been arrested in my life. Madam. I have. Don't you miss. Don't you. I have never been arrested in my life. I'm 73 years old. And I have come here because of them babies who's died. And I am being arrested. Running to. And then we saw Martin Daubney from GB News nearly be arrested. At Westminster, what is going on? Yes, it, it, the, the police, you know, the, it's an old, the, one of the oldest rules in the book, uh, Dan, is that the police should police uh, with neither fear nor favour. You might have heard that expression. It's one of the old principles of policing. That is entirely gone, it seems to me. They are now in a position where they are just managing uh, what is effectively kind of breaking down. And I think there's an element of fear in it, in the sense that with the Gaza demonstrations, uh, huge, hundreds of thousands of people screaming extremist rubbish, hateful rubbish about this country, from the river to the sea, all of this climbing over all of our monuments. Um, that was allowed to happen. And it was sort of tacitly even accepted, I believe, by a policeman who was caught on social media saying, well, there's more of them than there are of us, right? Now, in a way, uh, people like that lady that you just showed in the clip, they're sort of fair game. You can almost hear what your average liberal establishment member will be saying about her when they see that. I mean, you know, I think there's a general now, a kind of general 
contempt as well for working class people, especially white working class people that is abroad. It's, it's basically been there now in the culture for quite some time. There's almost nothing you can't say about them. You can certainly call them far right. Um, and this is a huge worry because the police, um, our police have always been, we've always had a pretty good relationship with our police on the whole. And that's one of the reasons for that is that they came on the whole out of the very class and out of the very community of people that they have to police. And so we always had a kind of good relationship. That is entirely gone. You know, honestly, now my, you know, I'm a kind of very typical English guy. You know, I respected the police and all of this. Uh, that is entirely gone now. I don't trust them at all. Um, and uh, I don't think they're on my side. Um, and I think that we're going to see that basically being illustrated more and more over the, you know, Yeah, coming. which, is, which yeah. is terrible, though, as you say, because I understand it. Let's see how the police have acted uh, in certain situations. I get it, but it is terrible when there is such incredible police bravery on days like Monday in Southport. So it is so sad that we have seen that breakdown. But it's not just coming from the police, as you well know, Peter. It's also coming directly from this new socialist government. And I want to show you the comparison of the new Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, who I believe is already doing a disastrous job. And this is a comparison of how she referred to the protests after, or the riots actually, after Hair Hills when police were attacked, compared to the riots in Southport this week. And while the words are relatively similar, there's a real difference in her tone and her passion when she's speaking about uh, the Muslim and uh, gypsy protesters compared to the white working class protesters. Well, I've been talking to West Yorkshire police officers and also local community leaders about the action they're now taking in response to those unacceptable scenes of disorder and criminality that we saw last night. Uh, the community is working very closely together in response to what was a, a local child protection incident. But it's really important that the community can feel safe on the streets and also that the perpetrators feel the full force of the law. A short time ago. So appalling to now see those same police facing violent attacks from thugs on the streets who have no respect for a grieving community. It's a total disgrace. Frankly, this is a time when everyone should be showing respect for a community and for the police. Completely different tone, Peter. It's, it's just utterly laughable. Um, and, you know, it makes me so angry, Dan, when you hear these people, like Yvette Cooper, saying that they show, you know, that they're showing no respect to the grieving families. I would say that this government and governments before over a number of years now have shown no respect, actually, to the wishes of communities such as in Hareholds. None at all. They don't take into consideration any of their views. They have been demonized, particularly by sort of people like uh, Yvette Cooper and her crew. Um, and I think that uh, basically it beggars belief that when you watch even, uh, you know, um, what's his name, uh, Keir Starmer going up there and laying a, a, a wreath, you know, in, in tribute, he walks this kind of ceremonial walk and he doesn't even stop to even talk to anybody um, or indeed listen to about why they might be heckling him. You know, unbelievable, you know, lack Exactly, of and that anger, which is yeah. visceral. And by the way, I have felt it all week. I have felt so angry all week, Peter, and I am so sick of being told don't look back in anger. We can no. only grieve. We've got to be sad. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I am angry. Now, that anger has to be harnessed in the right way. The right way is not throwing bricks at police officers, but arguably, actually, the right way is potentially, you know, I wouldn't call it heckling, actually. I would call it shouting questions at the prime minister, which the media 
I'm not asking him because the media are in the tank for Keir Starmer. And you know that if it was a Conservative Prime Minister, they would be asking those questions. Or if it was a Reform UK Prime Minister, maybe now we should start saying they would be asking those questions. But, you know, those hecklers who Starmer and the mainstream media have just dismissed were asking questions, Peter, like how many more children have to die? Surely that is a question that we should be asking. And what makes me sick, Peter, honestly, it makes me so angry. Look at the questions today from the corrupt mainstream media, the British Bashing Corporation, Channel 4, ITV News, Sly News. None of them were about how can we stop this violent extremism, this terror on our streets that is leading to the death of young children. None of the questions were about that. They were all about Nigel Farage, Tommy Robinson, social media crackdowns and disinformation. I just find that such a dereliction of duty by our mainstream media. It makes me so mad. Well, it's, uh, it's yes, exactly. It is uh, quite unbelievable, but at the same time, not unbelievable. Um, I'd say to you, Dan, we might disagree on this a bit. Um, this happens to be the latest incarnation of it, this Labour government. I don't remember the Conservative government particularly covering themselves in glory over the past few years on these kind of issues either. I mean, and the, the media, just forget about the media. They, you know, they are essentially the message carriers. You know this better than many people, Dan. You know, and essentially they are cut from the same cloth when it comes to views, right? I think that the problem is, you see, is that all of our institutions whether it's the police, whether it's the media, whether it's the judicial system, whether it's all the cultural institutions, they've all essentially been hollowed out. They now have the same kind of people uh, running them. They all sing from the same hymn sheet. You know, in the context of the police, for example, um, the chief of uh, the police chiefs, as it were, um, called his own forces institutionally racist, for example. And yeah, there's uh, no you know, coming back from so that, is there? There's no, I mean, he called them that. Um, basically, you know, the police were called institutionally racist famously after the McPherson report. It's this kind of charge which you could never disprove. And that's, that's the pernicious thing about it. But the, the main point about that is that it seems to me that since that report, they have their whole modus operandi is, it must, modus operandi is in showing how they are not racist, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that you go harder on, you know, people like the demonstrations that you've just illustrated and you ease off on the others. That seems to be their whole modus operandi. People are wise to that now. They're wise to it. Um, and I think that in a way, the problem is, is that when information is kept from people, like in the uh, most recent case, although actually now they've named the guy, as you said, after um, a challenge from after the media. A after a challenge, there are a lot of people on social media saying, oh, you know, you were, these demonstrators sort of might be Muslims or whatever it is. In a way, this is the kind of incoherence that happens when you just don't tell people things. Exactly, which would never happen, Peter, in America, where they have complete open access to the justice system and information. And actually, you are allowed to have these sorts of debates. Now... <sighs> You know, the other thing is, this guy wasn't named initially, Peter. Now, I know he has been now after this challenge from the mail, but he wasn't named because he's 17 years old. Well, Slippery Starmer and Labour want to give votes to 16-year-olds. They intend to enfranchise 16-year-olds. So... I'm sorry, if a 16-year-old is able to vote, according to Starmer, then they are able to be named if they are charged with stabbing to death three young girls. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it is... Uh, uh, there is no logic to the situation, Dan. There's, 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 there's no logic to it. I suspect that um, apparently he's 18 in six days or something. Yeah, this yeah. Um, but apparently, I, th I wouldn't be surprised if they actually decided to lift these court restrictions almost to sort of maybe try and stem further trouble. Well, yeah, but you know what's so frustrating to me? And the great thing about being independent, Peter, is that I intend to be completely transparent with my audience because there were times when I was working at GB News and the Daily Mail and you'd be told something by the bosses and I would 
want to explain it to the audience, but you'd been told, oh no, you just can't talk about that. And obviously, look, in the end, it, it, it got me in trouble and I exited, didn't I? But in this case, I am reading information about the 17-year-old who has been charged. I am actually looking at text messages from people who were at his school, for example. Now, I have not been able to independently verify them, but Peter, even if I did, I would, because of the reporting restrictions, I would not be allowed to talk about it on this show because I could be yeah. thrown in jail in the UK under contempt of court. So firstly, that means I think we are operating in a regime of censorship. That's the first thing. Uh, clearly, the Labour government intends to crack down on that even further. But it also means this is why the so-called disinformation is spread, because how ludicrous that I can't talk about truthful information, but I'm seeing it being shared on social media. So I, you know, Starmer's solution, Jess Phillips' solution is let's crack down on social media. My solution would be no, let's open up the exchange of information and let's actually acknowledge that we are in a new world where it's completely impossible now to say, oh, we're not going to say anything about this guy for six months, for nine months. I mean, it could be 12 months, Peter, before he actually faces trial, depending on if he pleads guilty or not, etc., etc. Absolutely. Um, uh, I completely, completely agree with you there. Dan. I think that, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, people obviously, we have to say this, and of course, it's right, you know, the people's, you know, civil disturbances or whatever, or, you know, we don't want to go down that route. But at the same time, when you look at the way in which people have been completely ignored, and completely demonized and i'm talking about working class people here white working class people utterly demonized uh for even bringing up any kind of concern let alone going on a protest and it's happened as well and uh, during a time when e when we've been culturally sort of under attack i mean from different angles the sort of things that you have um obviously uh, covered on your various programs. But, you know, the very notion of what is, why one should be proud to be British, proud to be English, um, you know, our history, all of these things over the past, what, five years have come under sustained and systematic attack, right? So people are extremely demoralized, right? Every day there is something. Add to that the fact that they are not allowed or not meant to actually question anything such as mass immigration, or multiculturalism, or Islamic uh, fundamentalism, any of these things, add to that. It is absolutely um, brought people, I think many people, to boiling point. Yes, uh, and, and uh, Peter, they want, uh, they want to stop us even yes. being allowed to have this conversation. Oh, yes. They have uh, already cracked down on GB News, which was my former employer it was challenging the narrative far too much i had to go mark stein had to go lawrence fox had to go calvin robinson had to go we've seen a massive change there and now they want to crack down on our ability to f speak freely here and seriously if they try good luck to them because we will fight you know i will if if it ha if, if we have to go into almost like peter a pirate radio sort of existence where i have to broadcast from an overseas territory in order to get the truth into the UK. I will do that. But it's so yeah. disturbing that this is the sort of language that we're hearing just four weeks into this government. I mean, I knew it was going to be bad, but my God. But also with this government, this week, this past week, of course, it's completely been, uh, you know, sort of uh, ignored under what, uh, quite rightly, under what's happened, um, you know, uh, recently, in these terrible murders. Um, but... Uh, they've actually dropped, for example, down the the new free speech uh, precautions that were set up, know. you know, in uh, universities. Universities are one of the worst places for um, censoring of free speech. Uh, this was to have a free speech czar to put in possible kind of safeguards about free speech in university of all places, universities. Um, they've just done away with it. And like you, I have, you know, a very, very... Uh, successful uh youtube channel 
Of course, it worries us. You know, it worries us. We talk about these issues all the time. You know, what is in store for us? You know, who knows? No, I know it's really terrifying. Um, Look, just one piece of breaking news, breaking right now. We have now heard from the judge in the case today involving Axel Rodakubana, and he has explained, Peter, why he decided to allow the media to name him. And he has said that it is because of the idiotic rioting going at the moment is in part fed by the nonsense online that feeds on the vacuum. So he described it as an exceptional decision, given that the defendant doesn't turn 18 until next Wednesday. But he said by continuing to prevent full reporting at this stage has the disadvantage of allowing others who are up to mischief to continue to spread misinformation in a vacuum and runs the risk that when the information becomes publicly available in six days time that will provide an additional excuse for a fresh round of public disorder. So that's the judge's rationale for allowing us to name uh, this 17 year old. But it looks like Peter they were going to allow us to name him next Wednesday because he's so close to turning 18. Right, right. Yes, well, just as I just said, it seems uh, it's pretty much consistent with what I just said, uh, Dan. I think that they, they're just sort of doing it as a kind of, uh, just thinking, you know, they might be in advice, oh, well, you know, this could lead to even more kind of rioting, more civil disturbances, and so let's just do this. That seems to be what they, what they have done. Um, mm. But I think, as you said, you know, it's a question of general transparency. Yeah, because we still can't talk. Let's just be very clear about this, Peter, right? As mainstream journalists, we still cannot talk about what this man's motivations might have been. We can't reveal the text messages that he ha- may have sent. There is still a vacuum effectively now Keir Starmer today says that's because of our justice system and it is that's how our justice system works but I guess I would argue uh whether in 2024 that makes any sense Peter because what that means is people will only be able to get that information online via social media sites they're not going to be able to get it formally Maybe in the past as well, you might have had a few intrepid local reporters who dug away and dug away and maybe uh, took a risk, you know, uh, but in fact, uh, they've all gone. I mean, we don't have any good lo- local no. going to say more of the, the papers no. about that. But what's so frustrating, because remember, I've worked in newspapers for years, and what happens is the journalists are actually allowed, I mean, it's interesting, maybe people don't know how this works, but the journalists are allowed to gather all of the information about this 17-year-old charge now, so they can go and speak to family members if they want, speak to fellow students, speak to teachers, speak to ex-girlfriends, they can literally do all of that, they can film the interviews, they can have them recorded, but they cannot publish until he either pleads guilty or is found guilty or not guilty. That's how it works. Now, the problem is that's going to be in a year's time. Peter, a million things in this country will have happened by then. And that is my issue. People move on so quickly because of our news cycle. So that's why I actually think Keir Starmer has been a dishonest actor in this case by trying to tell us today, oh, look, we just need to grieve for the moment. Don't worry, we'll get to talk about this. No, we won't. No, we won't. The court case will come and go. It will be a story once he's found guilty. But effectively, we do move on too quickly. I think, uh, I do hope that basically more people wake up actually um, about it. Um, I'm not, again, one has to keep saying this, but it is the truth. Um, It doesn't mean that you should go and start attacking the police. It doesn't mean all of that stuff. It doesn't. But I think that, thank goodness in a way, actually, for social media, as much as I might sort of criticise it, because without that, we wouldn't actually sort of actually get to know, we wouldn't be able to put pressure on. Yeah, no, exactly. Look, there are so many ills of social media. I mean, I was a massive victim of it last year, where false information about me spread. It was completely untrue. I knew it was untrue. I knew that it would provably be... Uh, I knew that it would be proven to be untrue, which has happened, but it's very difficult when things catch like wildfire. But the problem is, 
we don't want to live in a world of censorship either. That's too important. Thank you so much for watching Dan Wharton Outspoken. Please do subscribe if you want lots more clips and interviews like that. Plus, if you want to watch our totally uncensored after show, then visit www.outspoken.live.